Juan Vasca. Welcome, tervetuloa, welcome. Um, my name is uh, Nina Reen Mendoza. I'm the deputy director of Nordic Welfare Center. Together with the uh, web page uh, Popnad, uh, we have organized a seminar this afternoon. Uh, we are looking forward to a very exciting and stimulating discussion um, and information sharing between all the Nordic countries. Um, all the presenters will be speaking in English, but if anybody wants to present a question in Finnish or Swedish, we will help to translate um, so that you can feel free to speak the language that you are most comfortable with. Um, I will just begin with very few words about who we are, so you know um, what is the, the organizing um, institution. We are working under the umbrella of the Nordic Council of Ministers, Pohjoismainen Ministerineuvosto, Nordiska Ministerrådet, and their social and health sector. We have an office in Stockholm and in Helsinki, and we work broadly with the Nordic uh, welfare model um, and different aspects of, of welfare questions. We operate by organizing seminars and conferences on all the different topics, publications that you can find on our homepage, running networks in different areas, experts, um, public um, officers in working in the ministries, um, public health agencies. We have networks of researchers in different areas. And broadly speaking, dissemination and marketing of different Nordic best practice um, and knowledge and information. These are the four focus areas that we work on. Welfare policy, uh, social policy area, which is a very broad one. Everything from um, children and young people to elderly policies, welfare technology, um, anything under the social policy area. Disability issues, for example, the UN Convention for the Rights of People with Disabilities is one big topic. Integration, sharing examples of successful good practice of integrating newcomers in the different Nordic countries. And then our box, which is the public health box, where we have a traditional alcohol, drugs, tobacco, and also gambling. We have mental health, and we have health equity. Different projects running at the moment. But today, we are here to talk about cannabis, and to have a look at what's happening in the Nordic countries, what are the important issues, developments, how are the different countries dealing with controlling uh, cannabis use, treating 
cannabis problems and other questions related to cannabis. To start off, just a very, very brief look. So we have a similar uh, understanding of what is the current use. Um, we have a big decline. This is uh, ESPAD, so this is young people, 15 to 16. We have a substantial decline in Denmark in cannabis use from a high of 25% to, to 12 in the most recent. Um, the dotted line is the ESPAD average, so all the Nordic countries are well below the, the ESPAD average. And most of the other countries are at a fairly similar level, uh, around 6, 7, 8 percent, which is the ever tried. If we look at the last month, um, Cannabis use, it's a similar picture, but of course the level is a little bit lower. So again, a, the decline in, in Denmark, and then a fairly similar situation in, in the other Nordic countries. With a very low use, around 1 and 2 percent. But this is of course the young people, so you don't expect there to be very high. Yeah. Maybe the most interesting figure is among the young adults. Um, the EMCDDA uh, numbers are here, where we have Denmark at 17, uh, Finland 13, Norway and Sweden at a fairly similar 8 and 7 percent. This is last year use. Um, what is perhaps even more interesting, but a more complicated figure is proportion of these numbers have problematic use or risky use. Because this is last year use, so you might even get those that only use once a year, twice a year, that would not be a problematic use. Um, if we look at the data that we can find about more problematic use, um, as a proxy, um, we use daily or almost daily use. And we can find 0.4% um, in Denmark of the 15 or 16 to 64 year olds, 0.3% in Norway, and 0.2% in Finland. So very low numbers um, and reasonably close in Sweden, we don't have um, any number for the daily or almost daily, but last month use in Sweden in the same age category is 0.9%. You can't compare it to the daily or almost daily, but it might give a little bit indication. And then the last slide, please. These numbers are very difficult to compare, um, but it might give a little bit of indication for our discussion about treatment. Um, looking at the primary drug uh, for those entering treatment, we have cannabis in Denmark is 71% of all new entrants into treatment have cannabis as their primary drug. In Finland it's 21%, in Sweden it's 10%. And then there are the other drugs. So this was just a very brief background to, to give some picture of what the, the use looks like in the Nordic countries. This seminar is uh, streamed live on the web, um, and that's why we have to try to, to eat the microphone if we can so that everybody can, can hear it. Um, we also have a hashtag that we hope that you will be active uh, participating on. Um, the discussion will be led, and I will give the, the word to Arne Kinnunen, 
who is the deputy director at the Criminal Police Department at the Finnish Ministry of Justice. So, oh, okay, I will try again. Um, and we, he works with criminal policy and crime prevention. Um, he has a special interest in the drug policy area and has worked as a researcher at the former National Research Institute for Legal Policy, where his studies have concerned um, drug crimes, drug scenes, police work, and drug policy. So he will be leading us uh, through the, the seminar. So I wish a very fruitful and interesting uh, afternoon to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Nina, and uh, thanks uh, to the Nordic Welfare Center for organizing this uh, seminar. It is very timely and uh, important issue we are discussing here. Cannabis, cannabis policies in the Nordic countries, which are partly the same, but there are also remarkable differences. And it will be very interesting to hear about uh, different approaches and the uh, state of art in uh, respective Nordic countries. Uh, we will have uh, five uh, presentations here, about 15 minutes. Then we will have a time for questions and discussions after each presentation. And uh, we will end this day uh, for the, uh, with the panel discussion. And there will be also a coffee break in between. Uh, we, I would like to go ahead and start uh, presentations. I have an uh, honor to ask my good friend Helki Gunnlaugson to take the floor. He's a professor at sociology in the University of Iceland in Reykjavik, and he has uh, done uh, and published widely on research in criminology, penal policy, problems of drugs and alcohol in society. He has also a long timer in the Scandinavian Research Council for Criminology, served there as board member for 14 years. The council is, is at the moment placed here in Helsinki. But now, Helki, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Arne. It's a real pleasure being here. And I would like to thank the NFC for inviting me to come here to discuss this important uh, topic. And it's been a real pleasure coming here and meeting some of my old uh, friends and colleagues from NSFK. And uh, <clears throat> what I intend to do here today is to give you somewhat uh, a broad picture of the situation of drugs in, in Iceland. I'm not sure if you know much about Iceland. You probably know more about the other Nordic nations than, than, than Iceland. But we had some figures there from from uh, uh, use, uh, use of cannabis among uh, young people, and there Iceland was included. I intend to give you some data from uh, concerning also adults, but I will give you some, so, somewhat a, a broad picture of the problem of drugs in, in, in Iceland, not only cannabis, but the drug problem of drugs in, 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 in general. And this is somewhat kind of based on my research on the topic in, in Iceland. And in many ways, Iceland is not that different from the other Nordic uh, nations. We are probably closer to Norway, Sweden, uh, Finland than, than, to, than to, to, to Denmark, but we also have some similarities with Denmark. So what I will do is to give you some sort, as the title suggests, the patterns of use and how Icelanders perceive the drug problem and to give you some insight into control policies and what we might foresee in the, in the near future. First, the public and the problem of drugs in, in Iceland. Public reactions in Iceland to the drug problem. And this is kind of based on my uh, public uh, population surveys in the Iceland society. And it shows us very, very, very uh, in, uh, it's, it's clearly that uh, the concern that the public has for drugs. And, the, and my surveys repeatedly show that most respondents believe drug use and drug crimes to be the most serious crime problem in Iceland. And it reached a peak in 97 with the moral, with the panic over ecstasy, but it's always been very high, the concern of the public for drug, uh, dr for, for, for drug problems. And, and also at the same time, 
most uh, respondents, most uh, of the public believe that the drugs is behind the crime problem in Iceland. That, that's why we have a grave crime problem in Iceland, because we have drugs. So if you remove the drugs, the crime problem will be reduced. So this is kind of the public concern in Iceland towards the drug problem. And <clears throat> to give you uh, some indicators of this public concern, 80% of Icelanders have been shown to be in favor that the police would have more rights to uh, investigate drug crimes. And we see a, a generation gap in Iceland. The, the, the older generation in Iceland, 40 plus, 50 plus generation, is much more, more concerned about the problem of drugs than the young generation. The, the young generation is, is also concerned about drugs, but they are more concerned about violence and sexual crimes. But, but there's a great kind of generational difference between the young and the old in, in Iceland. But on the whole, we have kind of the social and, and cultural opposition to drugs in, in Iceland. And to give you some historical viewpoint on this, it started out with a concern for alcohol in Iceland. And for example, the beer prohibition in Iceland for most of the 20th century, where the, the Icelandic uh, authorities, they banned beer, but it was legalized in 1989 recently. But then it was replaced, kind of we can say, with drugs in, in, the, late 19, in the late 20th century and, and continuing into the 21st century. So we have this concern for, for substance use in, in Iceland which is being shared both by the public and the authorities. So the question comes up is how widespread is cannabis use in Iceland? We, we, we had a glimpse from, from Nina about the, where Iceland stands in that uh, respect. So maybe I'll just go very fast over this. But we can see that the 10th graders, uh, the, the use of cannabis among 10th graders is lower in Iceland than you find in, in, in Europe as a whole. And it's very similar to the use in Scandinavia minus Denmark. And as for the, the cannabis use in, in the past few years, it's been among very young people, it's been very stable, or it's been on a downward trend. We, we, we saw that very clearly a moment ago, so I'm not going to get into that much. But the more, more interesting part is about what about cannabis use among adults? Adults in Iceland. We, we, Iceland was not included in the slides that was earlier. So now you can get a picture of cannabis use in the general population among adults in Iceland. And this is based on my research on this topic for the last 20 years or so. My last survey about this was from last year. About one third of the Icelandic population, older than 18, admitted to have used cannabis at least once in their lifetime in 2017. It was from once to ten times or nine times. So one out of three. And, and we are seeing an increase of this use among the adult population in the past four years. An increase up from 25% in 2013 and 20% in 2010, in 2002. So, so we are seeing in the last four years a, kinda, a, 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 a significant increase in the adult population of having tried uh, cannabis. But, but, but what about having used it more than 10 times? That is also going up in the past four years. 12% admitted to have used cannabis 10 times or more in two, 2017, up from 8% in 2013. But what about the six months? The last six months what could possibly could be active users. That is also going up. 5% of the adult population older than 18 admitted to, to use in 2017, up from 3% in 2030. So we are seeing somewhat the use is going up among the adult population, while the younger generation is, is moving away from, from, from cannabis use. A little bit, or, or, or stable, or going away from it. So what we see here with the drug users in Iceland, and this probably reflects the same uh, situation in other Nordic countries, according to the reports that, that this was distributed for this uh, seminar, we can see on the whole for the Icelandic population, a large part of the, po of the adult population has tried cannabis. And we are talking about different surveys in the last three or four years. We are talking about one out of four or one out of three Icelanders, mostly young people who have tried uh, cannabis. And what we are seeing there is curiosity, experimentation, social use. And for the most part, this is tem temporary. And with this use, I mean, what is actually 
uh, controlling it, or, 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 or why does it go up or why, why does it go down? It has a lot to do with fashion. It's a lot to do with uh, the clothing or music taste, culture of fats, and also the somewhat availability. We have seen homegrown cannabis use. Homegrown in, in Iceland has been going up in the past few years, and so we probably have more uh, availability there, and probably less stigma to using it than before. But what we see in my data about the use of cannabis in Iceland is that most users who actually state that they have used cannabis, they stop using it when they grow older with wor work and family obligations taking over. So we see very little use in the 40 plus gener uh, population, very little in the 50 and 60. So it's basically among young people, 18 to 29, the highest, and somewhat among 30 to 39, but much lower than in the age group, 18 to 29. And, but, but what about this use, about this use in the, in, the, in, the, in the population? Well, only a minority of these users uh, needs help from the social and healthcare system due to their use. And, and, and also, uh, these users are, are mostly just ordinary citizens that are not involved in any other crime than their use. But that kind of begs the question, where is the drug problem? Where do we find it? Doesn't it exist? Yes, it exists. Of course, drug use is risky. Some end up abusing drugs, and there is some science about if, if you start using drugs at a very young age, 12 or 13 or 14, the risk goes up. And also, we know that alcohol and, and, and drug uh, dependence can hit anyone, I mean, all walks of life. I mean, there is no social, sp distinct social pattern behind alcoholics, but there is we have seen somewhat a, a pattern behind heavy drug abuse. And we have seen that in research uh, in the US and in Europe to some degree, and also in my research on heavy drug abusers in Iceland, that they have some social characteristics that are different from the general population. So what we see there is that, that, that the root cause of their problem is, is social and personal, and their drug use makes this situation e even worse. And what I've seen in my data about heavy drug users in Iceland is low formal education, limited work experience, life is being crime prone, healthcare problems, suicidal and victims of violence to a much larger deg degree than we find in the general population and also compared to alcohol abusers. This is the picture of kind of heavy uh, drug abusers in Iceland. But the, the recent opiate crisis, uh, which we have learned from in the US, you know, where the young people are dying because of uh, opiate addiction, we have seen that to some degree hit Iceland. And the, the official tale on this in Iceland is that this is hitting uh, ordinary citizens, not the, the, the old-time heavy drug abusers, but, but, but the general population in the, in the sense of mostly the young population, but not with really specific characteristics that I was just showing you, you earlier. I, but I have not seen research on it, so I can't really tell you if that's actually the case, if it's only hitting you know, uh, the population in, in general, or if it's specific groups like with a heavy old uh, heroin or, or opiate problems of the past. So how does society react? We have in Iceland society, it's, it's widespread opposition in society towards drug use and, and cannabis. For example, more than 80% of Icelanders opposed legalizing cannabis in 2014 and more than 60% was against the decriminalization of personal use in 2017. So this is my survey there. But still, you, you can see there, more than 60% against decriminalization, that tells us, and actually the figures show, that one third of the population is in favor of decriminalization of personal drug use. And who are these people, one third of the population, actually in favor of de decriminalizing personal use or possession for, for, for personal use? It's basically the young people. We are talking about half of the people in the age categories of 18 to 29 is in favor of decriminalization. And why? Well, this is actually the, the, the population that's actually using drugs. So they want a more relaxed uh, approach to, to, to the drug problem than the older generation who is not using drugs. We want to continue with the criminalizing process. And 
as you know, we are using many different measures against the drug problem. We are using soft ones and we are using tough ones. So now we come to the control policies in Iceland, the legal situation of drugs in Iceland society today. Possession and personal use of cannabis is criminalized. So possession and personal use of cannabis is criminalized. Not the use itself, you have to have something in your possession. And if caught, this is placed on the criminal record for three years and it's accessible to local authorities for 10 years. And how many cases do we have in Iceland concerning uh, po uh, possession and, and, the, and use of drugs? Well, it's close to 2,000 cases per year on average in the past few years. And about 70% of this only il involving s possession and personal use of drugs. Many of these cases are related with other types of crime in the sense of they are being caught in, a, in an act of, of crime but with some uh, drugs in your possession. But still, we are talking about the majority of the cases that the police is dealing with is actually personal use or possess, passion, possession for personal use. And in 2012, about two-thirds of these cases only included cannabis. But it's, the ratio is going down. Last year, it was, it was uh, half of the cases involved cannabis. And about so what you get if you are caught with, well, just a, one joint, so what kind of fine can you expect on top of going on a criminal record for it? Well, the minimum fine is around 400 euros for cannabis possession. It's more for ecstasy and, and cocaine. So 10 grams of, of, 10 grams of cannabis stipulates a 700 euros fine. And each addi additional gram and plant adds to the fine. So cannabis among drivers and youngsters. If any residuals of cannabis, THD, is detected in urine or blood of drivers, it is de facto driving while intoxicated, even though you used that cannabis maybe a month ago. Not under the influence of this cannabis drug you smoked one month ago, it is still uh, driving while intoxicated. So it's zero tolerance there. And as you know, it's not the same for prescribed drugs. If you get your drugs from the physician, and you were under the influence of these drugs from the physician, you're not necessarily driving while intoxicated, if you are believed to be a safe driver. Another thing, medical marijuana, never seriously considered in Iceland. The vast majority of the medical profession, they have come openly in Iceland, in the public, in the media, on interviews, saying, stating that they do not recognize any medical value in cannabis. And also how the, the medical profession looks at cannabis use. Typically they look at it as a, as a serious psychiatric problem, especially of young males. Uh, a dominant approach within the medical profession, linking cannabis use with psychiatric problems. Alternatives, about have, have we seen uh, alternatives to the drug problem in, in, in Iceland? Well, we have seen in the Icelandic parliament, we have seen some proposals coming up for decriminalization, or, uh, but they have never seriously been considered. It's basically come from the pirate party in Iceland, you know, it's young people, you know, but it have never really been taken seriously. But there is one exception to this, because in 2014, the Icelandic Minister of Health surprisingly stated that decriminalization of personal drug use should be considered. And he appointed an expert committee to revise and come up with new proposals on the issue. And this report was published in 2016. And it came out with, surprisingly, with uh, recommendations toward harm reduction. But we have no legal action have been taken toward this end, you know. So, so I don't know what will happen. And this is the Minister of Health. And of course, as you know, this is the Justice Ministry's uh, problem, you know. So I don't think, you know, it's going to be taken very seriously. How are we doing? Many claim we have lost the war against drugs. Drugs won the war. But conception of drugs is not very widespread. It's not very widespread among the adult population. It's increasing among the young, but not among the old. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and of course, why is, is it so? Well, opposition in society explains the situation. So we can see it's both fear 
And to some degree, we have to kind of admit it, that the restrictive approach is uh, limiting uh, or has contained uh, general dr use of drugs in society. We have a lot of stigma towards drug use, uh, and even though it's less today than, 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 than it used to be. And my, uh, 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 a few, uh, a last slide here. What will the future bring us? And this is maybe something for the, for the panel later today. Uh, will we look at prohibition of cannabis the same way we look at alcohol prohibition today? Uh, cannabis will be defined and regulated as alcohol and tobacco today. Can we fight cannabis the same way we have fought tobacco and actually limited tobacco use in the past few decades? Or will the temptation to tax and generate new state revenue replace uh, prohibition? And then finally just uh, is strict decriminalization of possession and personal use of cannabis or regulated le legalization a realistic and a sensible uh, drug policy? This is something for the, for the debate later on today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helgi. It was very good uh, run, running through the Icelandic uh, situation and the policy concerning cannabis. Thank you, Helgi. Helgi. Uh, I would like to ask the floor if there are uh, comments or questions for Helgi. I think we could take one or two comments now. And uh, I could mention that if you wish, you could also state uh, your comments in Finnish or Sw uh, Swedish or Nordic languages. We can help with translation. Okay, I think I can handle English. Um, yes, I'm Kimo Wilska. I'm, I was interested to know, considering that um, Iceland has a lot of hydroelectric power and geothermal energy, uh, does, and grows a lot of plants in greenhouses that aren't native to the country itself, how, to, how much of Icelandic cannabis is really Icelandic? I would say most of it. 99%. There is n not much of uh, smuggling of cannabis, marijuana to Iceland anymore, you know. Some people link it to the crisis in Iceland, the banking crisis, that the Iceland could not get, you know, currency to actually buy drugs from abroad, and then they st just started doing it themselves. But that was a major shift in the past 10 years, you know. It, it, it is basically Icelandic marijuana. <laughs> well, the, poli the police think so, you know. The police actually think there is some export, but they, they haven't been able to, to catch it, you know, if, if it actually is. Please. Can you hold the microphone closer oh. to your mouth and uh, speak an loudly? An explanation for the reduction of uh, the cannabis-related drug it, it, It's a good question, you know, because you see in the, in the police data, this is not really separated in their records, you know, when you read their records or the annual reports, you know. So I, actually I was inquiring myself about it, you know, and I was just realizing a few days ago that actually there has been a decline. But, but I, I guess it, to somewhat just reflects, you know, in the market in itself, you know, maybe more of the problematic uh, users or who are involved in, 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 in crime, that they are being caught with different substances, marijuana and amphetamines or, or other types of, of, of drugs, you know. With the, the general users of marijuana in Iceland, you know, they typically come from different walks of life in Iceland, you know, so they're not under the scrutinized or in the, the police focus. So that's probably one reason why we, we don't see much, or, or maybe this is called de declining, that we have the, the problematic drug users are probably being caught more than, 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 than others, you know. Because many of these cases, like I mentioned this, that uh, these drug cases is when they are being caught for other types of crime. And they have in their position under arrest, you know, they have some drugs, and not only cannabis, but some other drugs as well. Okay, thank you, Helgi. Now, I'm sorry we have to move forward. Maybe you can stay, state your uh, questions during the panel later on. Our next speaker will be Mats Anderberg, PhD from uh, Lecture University. Mats has uh, uh, studied and written extensively on substance abuse treatment and prevention, particularly among young people. 
And Mats also has a long professional career working with uh, youth sub uh, substance abuse treatment and social services. And uh, Mats will uh, speak with the title, When Cannabis is a Big Problem, Youth in Outpatient Cannabis Treatment in Sweden. Mats, please. Thank you for inviting me to this in interesting seminar. Oops. Okay. Uh, I would give you a, a snapshot of uh, cannabis treatment in Sweden and especially about uh, young people um, who come into contact with uh, uh, treatment centers, outpatient treatment centers in Sweden. Can I use this? Or? Yeah. Uh, the main uh, responsible for the uh, treatment in uh, substance abuse treatment in Sweden is uh, the municipality social services, and they uh, have uh, they offer psychosocial uh, treatments and also some support for housing and economy and like that. And um, the healthcare is uh, responsible for detoxification, psychiatric care, uh, medicaid, medical assisted uh, treatments and so on. And the Swedish National Board of Institutional Care have uh, uh, homes with compulsory care. Uh, I don't think it's uh, used use, uh, in uh, the other Nordic countries so much in as in Sweden. It's for both youth and adults with uh, more severe problems, you can, you can say. And we also have a criminal justice system that also have some uh, treatment methods uh, within the probation or in prison. Uh, the types of treatment uh, for cannabis problems is uh, uh, the, the most usual one is uh, it's called HAP <laughs> or HAP. Uh, it's very spread around uh, Sweden, uh, and it's about uh, f uh, 300 units who use it. And I think it's also spread some places in, in here in Finland and in Norway, in Denmark also. Um, and they, they have also developed a new program for young people called CPU. It's a, a HAP in a, a another a sh a shorter treatment, you can, you can say. The uh, evidence for the HAP and CPU is uh, uh, insufficient, you, but uh, they mention it in the national guidelines in Sweden. I have a quotation, you can read it there. And uh, other treatments for cannabis in Sweden is uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, family therapy, and uh, we also have a, a rather new web-based treatment. It's called Cannabis Help. Cannabis Help. Uh, I'm going to talk a little about uh, Maria Clinics. It's a growing concept in uh, in Sweden the last uh, 10 years, you can say. So, uh, have uh, in short time uh, spread to other places in, in Sweden. It's uh, uh, very specialized outpatient treatment and uh, it's done in a, in a collaboration between the municipality, social service and the county healthcare. So it's a form of integrated treatment that work uh, social wor social workers, nurses, um, often psychologists, and uh, they they all uh, have a doctor connected to them, uh, often in specialist in psychiatry. Also, uh, they offer guidance and counselling, not uh, uh, of course for the the young people and their relatives, but also for other authorities who came into contact with young people, for example, schools or um, leisure centers. Uh, th they use uh, different treatment methods, like 
you probably heard it before, <laughs> motivational interview, motivational enhancement uh, therapy, happen CPU, whether that all before, uh, CBT, uh, family, functional family therapy, and uh, brief strategic uh, family therapy in, it's only in Stockholm, they have that. Um, um, uh, as you can see, uh, this is uh, a picture of the uh, di diagram from uh, the Maria Clinics. And me and my research colleague, we, we call this uh, centers cannabis centers because most, as you see, uh, most of the, the young people who come uh, into contact with the, the treatment centers have uh, cannabis as their, their primary drug. But also if you uh, look at the, the, the young people who use alcohol and, and uh, other drugs, uh, eight to 10% of them also use cannabis. So it's an, a bigger, bigger than this diagram to tell you. How do they come into contact with the units? As you see, most come by family or friends, often some pressure from family and friends, uh, or the social services. Uh, but also uh, a, a rather big part is by, them own, by their own will or need. Uh, they contact the units. And you see the other parts. I have to go on, I think. <laughs> that I also jump over. Um, we have a newly, uh, newly published uh, a study where we have uh, uh, made uh, comp uh, comparisons between uh, girls and boys who come to the Maria Clinics. And as you can see here, uh, a rather little uh, group is uh, what you call needs. They are without education, employment or training in this group. Uh, so it's a rather good sign. Uh, but many of the young people have, have or had have school problems. And that's uh, a uh, known risk factor that also Hel Helge told about it before. Uh, so it's an interesting, and um, more girls and boys have also tell about the school problems. Um, we look at another, another um, table. Uh, the, the, especially the girls have uh, um, a childhood uh, up, or up, 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 upbringing conditions who are very severe and very difficult. They have had financial problems in the family, substance abuse problems, mental health problems, and violence also, also like the, the Helge told you before. So it's, it's a big difference between uh, girls who come into treatment, even if they are much, uh, so they, they are about a third of the total group, so they have more severe problems. Uh, and here is also around uh, alcohol and drugs, drug patterns, there are also gender differences, as you can see. Uh, many of the group in total have uh, also uh, alcohol, uh, a risk alcohol consumption. Uh, I think it's easy to forget that you, you, you focus often on the the drug problem, but uh, yeah, you, it's it's important to not forget the alcohol use. So. Uh, boys, as usual, use more often cannabis as their primary drug than girls. Oi, too too quick, <laughs> sorry, and. Um, but girls have a more severe uh, use of uh, more fre fre frequency. They uh, have the more polydrug use than boys. So it's uh, often more dif difficult, uh, difficult use. 
and but in the about the crim criminality uh, there are <laughs> the boys are in charge here as you can see they're uh, more arrested by the police or convicted by by crime than girls but the girls are more exposed to violence or abuse in different kinds, um, both physical, psychological, or sexual. So uh, the girls are more victimized than the boys. And also, when we talk about mental health problem, there are big, very strong differences between girls and, and boys here also except uh, the neuropsychiatric uh, diagno diagnosis. So they, they are, have more problems on, on every disorder or symptom. So. Okay, and then I, I uh, have, we have a last table here it's, uh, in this study. It's about the, the cumulative bo burden of risk factors. And if we look at the low risk group, it's about 31%. It's uh, fewer girls in that group. And in the middle group, the moderate risk group, it's uh, rather similar. But in the high risk group, uh, there are more girls, as you can see. So. Again, they have more problems at all, uh, overall. We have done uh, an earlier study about young people with cannabis as the primary drug. And uh, we, I've talked about before about the alcohol consumption. This study uh, focused on that uh, connection with, and how it uh, Looked by the drug patterns and, and risk factors and so on. So uh, here you can see the, those who use uh, uh, alcohol also uh, smoke cannabis more of, often, uh, and they also combine drugs more often than the no risk group. And uh, we sorted out nine different risk factors. From this, it is in this study, and uh, you reckon some of these uh, factors or also uh, Helge told you before have had substance abuse problems in their uh, childhood upbringing. Uh, they often association with criminal peers and drug abusing peers more often, and exposed to violence, victimization. Also, have uh, more depression and anxiety, concentration dif difficulties. Uh, I have some pictures. Also, uh, we have we were involved in a, a project uh, that aimed to uh, the Maria clinics want to build up a continually follow up system in the, the centers and. Um, we, we, this was a pilot study, so it, it's not representative. It's uh, about one third they uh, they uh, reached when uh, and do the follow up three months after uh, the treatment had ended. But you can see it's uh, oh shit. <laughs> okay. Um, it helps, the treatment helps, at least this uh, third group. Also in the mental health, you have to look at the pic these pictures before, a little later on. Uh, we are doing an ongoing study uh, that we want to follow up. About nearly 500 of the people we want to track them in uh, national registers. We think because it, it's a, a heterogeneous group, we have to follow different tracks for them afterwards. So, okay, then we have to summing up. <laughs> um, one uh, important uh, conclusion is that uh, this group is not homogeneous. 
and uh, they have uh, very very degrees of problems and and also very different needs. I have to have to all read this also <laughs> afterwards. I think uh, on also clear difference that I have told you about, but also uh, a good sign. So the more most of the pe young people are at least enrolled in school and uh, are, are working and practicing. Uh, but many of them have problems in school, so uh, it's important to do something about that also. Yeah, and ma many of them have also risky, risky, oh, sorry. Uh, risky alcohol consumption. And two-thirds of the girls have... Uh, uh, experienced vi violence, and also some at the end some implications for prevention. Uh, I think it's uh, important to reach girls at uh, earlier and to detect them. We know that they uh, have problems in school, and we know that they have uh, been in psychiatric care to a more extent than boys. So, I think it's uh, possible to to reach them earlier. And. Um, it's also diff important to uh, give uh, the young people s educational support so they can uh, finish their schooling. And then you have also some treatment implications. Okay. I stop there. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, very interesting description of cannabis treatment in Sweden. I think we have time for one or two questions, comments to Matt. Paul Larsson, please. Uh, just wanted to ask about the, how many girls compared to boys were in the treatment uh, uh, numbers, really. More boys, I guess, than girls. Yes, it's uh, about one third of girls. But, but yeah, even less, even less. Or in some uh, of our studies, it's about uh, twenty-five percent to thirty percent. And uh, it's not surprising that there have been uh, many of the problems with violence, in, uh, but uh, especially in Norway, there's been a lot of focus on sexual violence and uh, the, how sexual violence influenced drug use later in life and has been really scary findings. Mm, yes, it's a lot of studies that support the, the connection. But even uh, yeah, physical violence also. So. Mm. Uh, can I ask uh, one question? You <coughs> in your diagrams, um, uh, quite few of, of uh, Youngster had a connection to criminal justice systems, almost half, if I if I remember, right, forty percent or something. Yeah. But then, on the other hand, there are very few referrals to the treatment from yeah. criminal justice system side. Why why is that? Can you I, explain that? I think that? They, they came by uh, social services. The, the police uh, send uh, um, uh, yeah, what you call it? Some uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 to social yeah. services and the, so and the referral services, came there. It, it's taken care of. It, it's called youth contract, for example, in, in Sweden, very often used. Okay, thank you. Other comments, questions, please? Yes, I have a follow-up question to these categories. Because you said the 17% were self-referred. Yeah. Uh, do it's they differ from the others uh, in uh, significant ways uh, concerning problems, uh, poetry, socioeconomic status? Are they different? Uh, we, we have an ongoing study on that theme, so <laughs> I can't say anything yet about it. I'm, oh. I'm sorry. But it's more, more uh, girls that uh, have self-referral and also from healthcare, and boys more from social services and, and family. But uh, how voluntary is it, this treatment? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how voluntary can, is voluntary? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we cast a question. I have analyzed uh, uh, 
uh, lasting open question about uh, what motives they have, the young people they have for uh, contacting the, the units. And uh, about 55% they say I'm forced in any way by school or parents or police or some, you know, somebody. But uh, about 45% uh, if, if 40 per, 40 percent came by them. They have the, some form of uh, inner motivation that, that they want by themselves. So. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid we have to move forward. Thank you much for your contribution. You. Uh, our next speaker will be Karin Rantala. And, uh, Karin uh, works as an education coordinator at EHUT which is the Finnish Association for Substance Prevention. And during her career, she has worked with implementation and evaluation of different substance use prevention programs in Finland. And Karin will talk us about an early intervention for young cannabis users in Finland. Yes, hello, thank you. Um, like Lana said, I'm Karin Rantala. Uh, I'm going to be switching the perspective. Please closer, even closer to my. I'm, I'm going to be shifting perspectives more into preventive work and specifically early intervention and uh, risk prevention because that's <laughs> that's what I know about. Uh, maybe there's someone in the audience who knows more about the treatment side in Finland, but I can speak more about about uh, prevention. Like Anna said, I'm from from EHUT, which is an organization that works with uh, alcohol, tobacco and drug prevention and also um, issues related to gaming. And uh, the work covers, covers all age groups in, in Finnish society. Uh, but what I'm here to talk about is a project called uh, Intervention for Young Cannabis Users. Um, it's a joint project between EHUT and uh, another NGO called Youth Against Drugs. And uh, my project team is sitting here in the audience, <laughs> so you can say hello to all of them. Um, this is a three-year project uh, that started at the beginning of this year, so I can't really talk that much about you know, what we've achieved or what we've produced because we just started, so we're still in the very early stages. But I can talk about what our sort of plans and, and aims are, what we want to achieve. Uh, and this project is funded by uh, the European Social Fund. So first I'm going to talk about the aims of the project, and these are sort of overreaching slightly more abstract aims. I'm also going to be talking about what we'll be doing more concretely later on. But first of all, we, uh, we want to raise young cannabis users' awareness of the risks and harms associated with cannabis use. Uh, and we also want to provide them with support to stop using or to reduce use. Um, and of course, the reason why we're focusing on young people is because most cannabis users in Finland are young people. And that's also a logical group if you want to uh, intervene early into use and also work with the risk prevention. Um, also, we want to reduce the need for specialized drug treatment. So that means also saving resources, but also kind of lightening the load for people who, who work on that side of things. Um, and we want to make sure that uh, professionals who encounter these young cannabis users in s sort of their everyday context, contexts have uh, tools to work with them in a way that's supportive and motivational. So we think this is particularly important when you're working with young people and, and maybe even more important when you're working with young cannabis users because they tend to be a group that doesn't easily seek support or help. Um, so that's why it's important to be positive and, and work in a way that's motivational. Um, we also want to utilize uh, peer knowledge, experience, experiential knowledge in this project 
and I'll talk more about that later on. And uh, one of our aims is also to lessen the stigma that's associated with cannabis use. And uh, we'll be arranging some type of a campaign related to this subject, but that will be sort of later on. We're not focusing on that just yet. Right. So what we'll be doing more specifically, uh, we plan to create uh, an intervention that contains both self-help tools for young cannabis users, um, and this toolbox will also include some type of uh, web-based intervention, so that we can also e uh, reach these young people over the internet. And this will also, of course, kind of uh, lower the threshold for seeking support. Um, and we're also going to be uh, producing tools and materials for professionals. And like I said, it's professionals who, who meet these young cannabis users in their kind of everyday contest, contexts. So um, people like school nurses, school counselors, uh, youth workers, also social workers. Um, and that also sort of lowers the threshold because they're people who these, who these young people sort of see every day and maybe even know personally. Um, and of course, we'll be training these professionals in how to implement the intervention. Now, like I said, it's really important for us to also uh, use the, the knowledge and expertise that young cannabis users have themselves. So that's why we have a, a whole group of, of young people with some type of cannabis use experience and they'll be supporting us and giving us their, their knowledge and their expertise throughout the whole project. Uh, and also we'll obviously come into contact with young, young people in lots of other ways. And we'll also be using the knowledge and expertise that professionals have who already work with these young people. Uh, and then I'm going to just briefly say something about sort of the framework that underpins this whole project. Now, this is just part of it. But I've just picked out some things that I think are particularly important. Um, so I've already talked about risk prevention and, and early intervention. Um, so that's what we want to do. We want to uh, intervene into the cannabis use as, as early as possible. And of course, most young cannabis users are still at the kind of experimental stages of use. And many of them don't go any further. So we also want to support them so that they don't, don't start using more. But then the focus will also be on, on young people who who use more and ha who are already at risk of developing more, more problems and issues related to, uh, related to the use. Um, we'll also be uh, focusing on harm reduction. So uh, quitting cannabis use won't be the only option. Reducing use will also be will also be an option in this intervention, but that, of course, only applies to young people who are over 18. With, with minors, we still have to like, uh, stick to a, a zero-tolerance policy. Um, and I've already talked about why we think it's important to have a, a motivational approach in this intervention, uh, and uh, also a holistic approach. And the previous speakers already talked about how important it is to look at things like school performance, uh, mental health, social relationships, things like that. So, so um, that will also be included in the intervention. Um, and I think I already mentioned that we want to reach young, young cannabis users in their everyday context. So that's why we want to work with the professionals who who they encounter in their everyday lives. And that's why we also want to be on the internet. So that's why we'll be producing this web-based intervention. Yes. 
So that's all I have to talk about. I've kept this quite short because I'm hoping <laughs> you'll have lots of questions and maybe comments. Um, if you want to ask about like treatment options in, in Finland, I can try to <laughs> answer your questions, but that's not really like, my area of ac expertise. But maybe there's someone else in the audience who, who can also talk about that. Okay, thank you, Karin. Very interesting description of uh, health for the cannabis users on behalf of EUT organization. I would invite the floor to ask questions, comments. Hendrik Tam, please. You single out cannabis as a specific problem. Uh, would you regard this as a special group or did they before the cannabis use start with alcohol? Uh, th there are some data showing that we have a new generation that is going primarily direct into cannabis. While the traditional picture is that they would come from alcohol. That has of course policy implication that the best cannabis preventive policy would be a restrictive alcohol policy and on the individual level it would mean that you would maybe intervene already when they're drinking too much. Yeah, um, I think that's an important perspective. Um, I think most cannabis users in Finland also use alcohol and, uh, and tobacco, yeah. But I mean, alcohol is still like the main, <laughs> it's the drug of choice in, in, in Finland. Um, so, un unfortunately, Finland as a society is kind of w moving away from a restrictive alcohol policy, so we can't really <laughs> rely on that. Um, so I, d I do think we need preventive measures that are spef specifically focused also on cannabis. But I mean, it's, a, it's true, we can't forget about alcohol. And I mean, <laughs> that's one of the important focuses that I heard has, but, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions, please. Uh, yeah, yes, I noticed there at the end of one of your lists, uh, there was a mention that one goal is to reduce the stigma concerning cannabis. Now, that, now this is kind of a refreshing turnaround, I would say, compared to uh, the way things were about two decades ago when uh, nothing that you could say about any illegal drug in Finland seemed to be um, terrifying enough. Uh, has there been some controversy in, in taking this kind of approach um, within your community? Um, well, I, I would say there hasn't been much of a controversy yet, but I'm expecting that <laughs> it will come at some point, yes. Uh, I do think there's quite a bit... Well, uh, I think the situation in Finland is sort of the same... In Finland is sort of the same as in Iceland, where the older generation still thinks that all drugs are bad and will like automatically kill you, <laughs> including cannabis. I'm exaggerating a little bit. And then uh, young people's attitudes are way more lenient. So I think we we have to sort of move with the times. Uh, yeah. Because, because one example that, that just comes to mind from the United States, their current attorney general, Jeff Sessions, is taking a very hard line on, I, on yeah, cannabis. He says that... Mm -hmm. Good people don't smoke pot. Um, but that's not your approach anymore. No, that's not our approach. I'm, there are, I'm sure there are plenty of people still in Finland who, who feel that way, but that's not our approach now. <laughs> yeah, still like a continuing this discussion is Ehud uh, participating in, in uh, uh, public discussion or political discussion, and giving uh, statements on possible government uh, proposal regarding alcohol policy, drug policy? Uh, yes, Ehud has been very involved in, yeah. in commenting on alcohol policy. Unfortunately, things haven't 
really <laughs> gone the way we wanted them to go, but we're going to keep working on it. And I, I think Ehud will be commenting on, on drug policy as well. Although I don't think anything like major will happen in that area in Finland in the next couple of years. I don't think there's really any kind of political will to make any massive changes to mm. drug legislation. But I might be wrong. Yeah. So, but uh, in conclusion, the uh, discussion is more open now, and, uh, and uh, even uh, organization that has uh, previously been been kind of labeled as uh, hardliners can now speak in different manner of the of the issue. So, I, I would say that's a kind of interesting one of the interesting developments in Finland. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's time to have a coffee break, and we will break for 10, 20 minutes. And uh, coffee, is, I believe, it's right in here. And uh, I would like all of you to come back uh, half past two, so we can continue with the program. We have quite a tight program, so we don't want to be late. Thank you.
Okay, my friends, let's uh, continue the discussion uh, after the coffee break. Our next uh, presenter will be Mia Maria Magnusson. She's a police inspector and a doctoral student. And Mia Maria uh, has worked in, uh, in the police force of Stockholm for a long time, and at the same time she's, she's doing her PhD dissertation at Malmö University. She has worked with the drug crimes within the police about 10 years. And now she's focused on police practices and methods to combat drug crimes, inclu including a uh, research control trial study that she will present today. And another PhD project is focused on substance use abuse patterns among adolescents with the overall aim to understand how the police can improve their work with adolescent at risk and uh, how to better spread and allocate detection risk. <coughs> so we will have an interesting presentation in front of us. Mia Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hi, um, I'm very happy to be here, and I have been asked to talk about my uh, randomized control trial that I conducted at the open drug scene of Stockholm called Platon. Is this close enough? Yeah. Um, I would wanted to just add some of them. I think that the police perspective adds some, uh, in some way, another piece of the puzzle to the. the what can you say how it's about the, uh, the cannabis uh, in Sweden right now? And I would add, the thing I'd like to add is the. Um, Increased level of THC that's been found in cannabis in the um, deceased uh, hush and cannabis from the police. Um, no, yeah. Um, this is things that we see in the uh, from the police uh, in the cannabis uh, development right now. Um, and. The trend has been um, that the abuse profile that we meet is characterized by mixed drug use, um, using different drugs at different periods or using multiple drugs at one time, at, this, uh, at the one at the same time. And that the internet, um, as a means of marketing and distributing drugs, has gained importance. Uh, so the products with high THD, uh, THC content will continue to shape um, and the the market on internet, um, the Swedish drug market for the police. Um, and in Sweden, furthermore, we have the indications that small-scale uh, domestic cultivation has increased. Um, but Sweden still has a continuous inflow of marijuana from abroad, so we are not considered to be self-sufficient in the cannabis yet. Um, also that uh, more today more than 400 substances are regulated in Sweden as a drug or health hazard and the number is steadily increasing and, 
And also that the drugs, of course, uh, in for the police are a part of the um, f several games, or what you call it. A large extent includes um, criminal networks, multiple crimes, but also the basis of illegal activity. Um, and the drugs play an important role in the connection of young people to organized crime and the establishment of criminal identity. And younger individuals are often used to sell drugs in local uh, criminal networks and other types of networks, such as in the criminal motorcycle um, environment in Sweden. Yeah. And also the presence of drugs, of course, affects the perceived security in local communities. Um, this is due to open drug sales that are ongoing in connection with areas and centers in certain local areas uh, involving young people. Um, and in criminal conflicts and settlements, um, unpaid debts and competitive situations, to, with the purpose, of course, is to establish, um, maintain, or expand market shares. And uh, Sweden, as many other country, uh, countries, and uh, Stockholm, in, as uh, many other European cities are uh, fighting open drug scenes where drug use and drug trade create problems for both society and the police. And uh, Swedish police have, and other police agencies in, other <laughs> in, in, the, in uh, Europe and in the, of course in Nordic countries have uh, adopted uh, punitive and harm reduction strategies, sometimes in, even in combination. Um, and the debate is long and ongoing in Sweden and abroad as to whether police involvement with abusers actually helps the individuals or if the government will invest too much money on these investigations with little or sometimes negative effects. Uh, however, when, an, when addicts are placed in rehab, we can see that, and they stop abusing, society does save a great deal of money. So uh, police, Swedish police consider themselves to be responsible for discovering addicts and connecting them to healthcare or social services. And one tactic used uh, in being the link to healthcare to make individuals f uh, found in drug crimes to seek help is conducting a form of motivational interviews. Although not as structurally and in-depth as uh, healthcare use. And the motivational interviews, I also call them in my uh, paper, I call them motivational talks. Because um, uh, in my method, um, the way they are used in the police, uh, by the police are not the same. As, um, they are used in throughout Swedish healthcare system as well as social services and correctional cares. Um, and within the Swedish police, um, the motivation interview has been used in different departments and projects. Um, one uh, project called, or is still ongoing, it's called SMADIT. It's in about. Uh, it's in within the intoxicated drivers. Um, the police are collaborating with healthcare and MI is used to by health professionals with offenders arrested for uh, intoxicated driving. Evaluations show positive effects for changes in behaviors, um, but, show, but also show that police officers lack knowledge of the MI. Uh, and education for officers has been suggested for many uh, evaluations. And we also have uh, Moomin, which is together with Maria Clinics, um, an evidence-based method of Stockholm police officers. It's a really, really regional uh, project. The officers shall use this uh, method when dealing with individuals under the age of 20, when they are detected of drug crime or possessing, of possessing uh, risk behavior. It's a collaboration between the Stockholm police and healthcare, which began in 2004. And it's aimed towards suspect, uh, young youth suspected of drug crimes, where, where care is offered immediately together with the parents, um, mainly focused on the inner, in the inner city, area, uh, city area of Stockholm. Um, both the professionals, uh, health professionals and police were educated in the MI. Yeah. Another similar project is called LUTS, also done in Stockholm. It was aimed against heavy abusers and started in 2005. Um, and nurses were pointed out to lead the abuser through the 
care system and have a very tight contact with the abusers. Uh, so the Swedish police practice MI has been a part of many projects with positive results and linking abusers to healthcare treatment. But the police, however, do not educate or document the practice. And after being in, in contact with officers in different departments and police management, it is clear that no education of the MI method is being done today and has not been since regional projects described above from th 2004 and 5. But the tactic of motivating drug offenders to seek help is widely used and practiced every day by police officers. Um, and it's clear that the tactic and the way that it's been used today has not been evaluated. So that's the base of my experiment. The base is also that um, we have taken the frustration from the practitioners, the police officers, of working at the plattan and not feeling that they make any change. They see the same abusers day in and day out. Are they actually making any difference? And we've tried to see more than the gut feeling that often is the thing that the work the police uh, follows more than actually structured analyze this. Um. And um, I've been uh, basing this um, randomized control trial on uh, the research done by uh, criminologist Lawrence Sherman, who's the, yeah, he prom promotes the evidence-based policing, uh, where actions and strategies meet policing goals in the most cost-effective manner. That's his um, device. And uh, he has done early work from uh, doing randomized control trials in the beginning of the 1980s, where police officers uh, randomized their how they acted against uh, <laughs> offenders of uh, <coughs> crimes. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, violent crimes uh, in the. Um, I'm sorry, the English uh, translation is not very good right now. Um, sorry. Domestic, Domestic violence. violence, yes. And um, this, uh, his experiment was. Uh, inspired me to do this uh, drug enforcement trial in Stockholm. Um, and we had 24 police officers detective and reported crimes of an, uh, offense, uh, offenses during an eight week period in the spring of 2016 um, at the inner city, city area called Plattan, which is the Sweden's biggest open air drug scene. And uh, of course, on the hotspot for drug crime. And uh, the experiment did not include data from healthcare or social services sectors. Mm. Um. And the process that are uh, basing also. Uh, the uh, experiment is the hypo hypothetical process underlying the use of the motivational tactic. If motivational talks are effective, they will result in individuals seeking healthcare treatment. If this treatment is effective, it will lead to less drug crime, uh, which will in turn lead to less drug crime. Uh, in this case, the RCT uh, measures the effect of motivational talk on the relapse of, into drug crime. That RCT does not measure to the other two steps in the process. And the plan was for the officers on the street to randomize their use of the motivational talks in order to create two groups and to then measure relapse into drug offending to see whether the treatment group would behave differently from the other group, thus showing whether motivational talks have any effect on the risk for continued drug offending. And all the encounter suspects, is the, the first and then we had to take out an exclusion criteria list, checklist. And then all the ones that it were included uh, could be randomized. And they were randomizing due to the, number, the time at which the interrogation held were uh, finished. Even numbers, they uh, were placed in the experiment group and they had the motivational talk. An uneven number, the control group, 
they were placed in the control group and let go. And the exclusion criteria, whereof uh, one of them is if they, the offender was younger than 20, they should use the Moomin project. This young person will not be included, for example. Or if they had m a lot of other offenses at the same time, or if they were deprived of liberty, or if the interrogation couldn't be held due to limitations such as language, interpretation, or other stuff. Um, this is the consort flow. We had 236 cases in the beginning. We random, they randomized 144. And uh, due to um, repeated treatments and biased because of not giving the right treatment due to the clock, um, we had f 54 analyzed in the experiment group or and 50 in the uh, control group. And did motivational talk prevent relapse into drug crime? Um, the police officer in the beginning, at the start of the experiment, was that they were very skeptic about giving this treatment. Some officers, of course, have been working at this place for 20 years, uh, motivation, motivating abusers. Uh, and uh, they did it as, as always, whereas the young officers sometimes felt that they ended up wasting time, uh, feeling that, that they were n not effective. A lot of criticism and a lot of inefficient. Uh, they felt that they were inefficient at the place. And actually, they were, uh, if you consider this. No, the, the, the method of motivational talks uh, are hard to measure. Uh, and, uh, so we had to do it the randomized way. But even then, the, the treatment is hard. So did they actually, the officers say exactly the same things? How long were the talks? Things that were hard to measure. Um, um, at the first follow-up, uh, nine months, 48% of the experiment group had relapsed into registered drug offending, as compared to 55% in the control group. After 18 months, however, the difference between the groups had become even smaller, with 63% of the experiment group having relapsed and 60% of the control group. So their conclusion must be that there is no evidence that the motivational talks provide an effective means of encouraging drug offenders to, con to contact the health sector. Um, at the same time, it is possible that the motivational talks may have such an effect and that the absence of an effect is in the relapse of drug offenders is instead, is instead is due to ineffective healthcare measures. Um, but uh, we didn't have anything, s anything said about the motivational interviews or in the motivational talks before. Uh, so now there's, we have some guidelines on how to use the time. And maybe we should meet, uh, try to again uh, measure if a repeated treatment could give any other effects seen in other evaluations of the MI method. Thank you, Mia Maria. Very interesting trial. Uh, questions, comments? Please. Can you introduce yourself to the audience also? Good. My, my name is Petri Viglione, and I have two questions. One is um, uh, last year uh, was a statement of, uh, from the police uh, association of, in Germany that they say that. Uh, this statement said that they want a liberalization of cannabis. So the first question is, what is the idea, if you have discussed on that and through your police association, what is your point of view? And the second question is um, about the, the use of, uh, of cannabis like medicine that is now possible in Sweden and in, Finland and in Norway and in other 15 countries in, uh, in in Europe, uh, from a police view, you have seen some uh, problems with the use of medicine, cannabis that, that you have had uh, from a police uh, view, or do you think that everything is okay? 
Um, I have a hard time answering for the National Swedish Police. Um, I'm, I cannot really say, but what I can say is that the Swedish police are working against the legalization as good as they, um, as good as they can, I think. And um, I, I'm a member of the Swedish narcotics drug, uh, narcotic, uh, police narcotic. Uh, it's a big um, uh, uh, yeah, association, uh, and they work hard to uh, counteract the tendencies in the in the in both. Uh, I would say the media and the social media. Uh, also some parts of the Swedish um, government prop propositions that are been written. So that's my point on that, but I wouldn't, couldn't say that I'm speaking for the Swedish police. And the other question was about the use of, the use of cannabis like medicine. So for purpose, do you see from a police view that has, has been a, caused some problems or not? Um, I can say that uh, they, they, I've heard uh, and I was sitting and taking part of discussions with uh, the National Police Board and uh, uh, I, the tendencies are affected. I would say that um, legalization in the USA as much as uh, um, closer countries uh, considering the use of medical marijuana of, of course affects the young population in how to think about marijuana. marijuana. Maybe that's affecting some of the small tendencies in our younger population in the cannabis use. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are lack of time, but we have now two short, three short questions, and uh, then we must uh, continue. Just there, and then. Uh, thank you very much for a very good uh, presentation. And I thought it was so interesting that you couldn't find really find an effect uh, of uh, using. Uh, but did you did it change the relationship between the drug users at Plotan and the police? Uh, did it have other effects that you didn't measure? Did, was uh, the relationship less tense? Did they like the way the police talked to them? I mean, did it have another outcome than uh, what you measured? Um, I I did an, I did a survey of the police officers afterwards. And, and I could say that the use of motivational interviews uh, went down during the experimental period. So the actual use of uh, motivational interviews or talks, as I will call them, uh, were actually more before and probably after. And, and they all responded to, we had, an, of course, an education of what, what do you think is contains, so what is a motivational talk for you? What, what do you should we had a, some kind of um, education. So, and, I, and they all said that after the experimental weeks, they were using it more often. And even though if they had, um, some of them as, uh, responded that if there were evidence of the method being ineffective, they still would like to use these kinds of talk because it feels good and they get so much other stuff than just handling them over to successful rehab. There's much other things happening in between officers and abusers, so yes. Okay, thank you, Mia Maria. And then, Andrew. Yeah, just a brief comment on the previous question regarding uh, law enforcement and uh, drug policy reform. There's also now in Scandinavia an organization called Law Enforcement Actionship Partnership uh, Scandinavia, which is uh, a pro-reform organization. I don't know if you heard about that, but uh, it was just in Germany, but now in Scandinavia also, and it's intending to be a pan-Scandinavic thing. Okay. Thank you. Paul, maybe you can come back to that later. But um, uh, thank you, Mia Maria. It was a very interesting presentation. And uh, good luck to your PhD study. And I'm, I'm also personally in favor of uh, scientific research. And it was a good example of a randomized control trial. Certainly, we'll look it up closer later on. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go forward. We have a next presenter here, Paul Larsson, the professor in the Norwegian Police University Colors, uh, uh, College. Paul is a <coughs> long-timer in uh, criminology. He's, he also has a visiting uh, uh, professorship at the uh, University of Vieksjö in Sweden, 
He has been working in the field of criminology since 1990 in organized crime, money laundering, regulation of drugs, police science studies, etc., etc. Pleased to have you here, Paul. Floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I have a sort of Mariana Green uh, presentation, as you can see. <laughs> and uh, you, you mentioned Leap. I'm a I'm a board member there. Yeah. And, uh, uh, a a pan-Nordic uh, Scandinavian organization, but I don't think we have any Swede in it yet. Swedes are really die-hard prohibitionists. <laughs> uh, so, so we are growing, and uh, as an organization, we are still we started in October, November last year. We're not many in numbers, but I can think I can tell you that uh, the members are um, very, very. We have the best police officers and the best ones from law enforcement. <laughs> so uh, if you don't have the big numbers, we have the quality. Uh, we also have, uh, like uh, you mentioned, we have something called an NNPF in Norway, which are really die-hard believers in uh, punishment. I'm also a council member of FTR, for uh, Foreningen for Tryggere Rus, uh, Ruk, som er, uh, it's an association for, for trying to get uh, safer uh, use of drugs. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about then is the policing bit. And, and also, I think I have to, uh, I guess a lot, of, a lot of you are probably asking, what's happening in Norway now? So, I try to use the last five minutes or some around that theme. Uh, and I think no one can really answer that question, but uh, at least I can uh, I can uh, uh, bring up some of the questions that's uh, sort of boiling under the, uh, the, the 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 happenings in Norway. Let's see if I can do this. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> First of all, if if you want to sum up uh, how the police thinks about this, then I would say the police thinks in this way. They think that punishment works. That's the short, uh, the very short version. Punishment works. If you ask police officers and uh, many who work in law enforcement, that's the basic thing. And as you can see from the numbers, it looks like things are just growing and growing. Uh, these are the investigated cases from uh, 1968. We had six months maximum imprisonment rate for for, for, for narcotic or uh, drug. Uh, drug offense or offenses. In 1984, we had uh, gone up to the level of 21 years as maximum. And as you can see here, uh, drug cases have exploded. They have gone from 201 then in, uh, in 68 to 30,291. That's 150 times. <laughs> so it's not 150%, not it's 150 times. And at the same time, you can see uh, the total registered uh, uh, investigated cases have uh, increased like uh, 5.6 times. So uh, what's uh, been happening here is that you have an immense growth in uh, the use of police and law enforcement in this period. Um, in the first first time first period time here, I think the idea about it has changed a little bit. Uh, in the first years, uh, the idea was to take the big sharks and the big men, the the one who really was behind and the, the cynical ones who made money from uh, from drugs. But we quite fa quite soon found out that most of these people who end up in prison or end up with sentences were not uh, sharks at all. So research uh, quite early on in the early 80s showed that they were actually most of these people are users themselves or small time pushers. So uh, the system ends up eating the ones on the low level. So after a while, you got some other ideas about why we use punishment. We have uh, I believe that we could uh, actually stop the availability of the drugs. That by, by uh, police actions we could uh, reduce the intake of drug or the, uh, the import of drug in the country. And you know in all Nordic countries, especially in Norway, you know, drugs become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. <laughs> so today, you know, the price of hash today is, uh, I think it's still around 150, 100 kroners, which has been like from the mid 70s. And today, that is no money. In the 70s, you could buy a, a lot of things for 100 kroner. And heroin is very cheap, and so on. So this has not been a success. Everyone is quite uh, do quite agree on that. And of course, the last sort of idea was that uh, 
and uh, that is the one that the police now is fighting uh, uh, why they keep want to keep the use of punishment is that this is a sort of a, we need it to prevent crime so in crime preventive measures and <coughs> and no one is against crime prevention are they well i start to uh, i'm actually i've developed into becoming against crime prevention because a lot of this crime preventive stuff in norway and i know in the most other nordic countries is very very uh, harsh and it's uh, it's also very uh, going into the personal sphere they they sort of breaking down a lot of the barriers that they used to have in the in the use of penal law and so on so i'm not that fond of it and especially when it comes to the drugs a lot of the things that they're actually doing here is quite harsh. It's, this is not a, this is not a soft uh, preventive. With some other figures here, uh, these are the numbers reported from uh, 93 to 2013. What you see is that uh, it, it grew all the time until um, 2013, which uh, sort of they had a maximum there. And as, as you also can see, it's been a little dip from 2001. It went a little bit down. And I said that one of the reasons was that we actually had a, a minister of justice who said, stop running after the tired drug users. So maybe that was a part of it. Uh, since 2013 to 2013, uh, the numbers have gone down like 20%. But that is not, that's just normal because the uh, crime rates in Norway has been going down quite much too. For the last 10 years, it has been reduced by 27%. So this is sort of just reflecting the general trends also in uh, the reporting. <coughs> and as you can see, uh, it went from 5.5% uh, of the reported cases in, uh, until it was the second largest category with 18%. And I still think it's around there because it's, uh, all the other figures have also dropped. Reality behind the numbers, yeah. Organized crime and the big sharks. Well, that's where we started, and uh, we, we catch very, very few of those, if we ever do. Well, we have <laughs> once, once in a while we have one like Kaplan, who actually sit there in courts and boasts about 20 tons of hash. So actually, we, we catch some, but uh, very, very few. Approximately 50% of the reported cases are breaches of the law on drugs, legemidloven. And that is uh, concerning use and possession. So around 50% of these uh, 35,000 cases uh, is concerning that. And approximately 2.5% are so-called serious cases. Uh, and, uh, to be, uh, to be called a serious case in Norway, you have to be caught with more than one kilo of cannabis or cannabis products. As seen in an international perspective, one kilo of cannabis is small fry. That's not serious crimes, people. That's <laughs> what you got in your backyard. backyard. So, uh, so you see, uh, uh, I used to do some research on import on hash and uh, what we call big cases in Norway. We came to the, the Netherlands and just laugh and say, this is not big. But we have some quite big cases. We have some, co what's the consequences of this? First of all, uh, these uh, numbers are very good for the police because the clear up rate is 90%. And if you know the clear up rate for other crimes, you know, like uh, theft or uh, uh, those uh, theft related crimes, you know, they, in a big city they would be like 15%. So these are often used to uh, sort of fix up the figures because we are very. Uh, Norway, we want to have very high, the clear up rates is uh, tell how good police work we do, which is actually bullshit. It <laughs> doesn't tell anything, it tells about the mix of cases. That's what it tells. In 40% of all the criminal cases ends with a criminal sanction, the main cri uh, crime is drug crimes, you see. So even if it's only 18%, 40% of all the criminal cases that ends up with a sanction is of this sort. 32% of all the prisoners had drug-related crimes as the main offense in 2005. So this means that one-third of all the, our prisoners were there because of drug-related crimes. And much of this work is what I would call low-hanging fruit for the police because they're very simple. It's very easy cases. And they're fast and have a high clear operate and so on. What about cannabis then? Because this was drugs in general. <coughs> in uh, 
2010, the numbers of seizures of drugs was 31,000. And 42% uh, of this was cannabis. 26% amphetamine or methamphetamine and 16% benzo in Norway. If you go to 2017, then it's 33% hash, 12% marijuana or um, plants. And that's quite interesting because in 2010 we didn't have much marijuana in Norway. After that uh, we had, uh, like some other, like you said, from Iceland, uh, home production has grown. So uh, today it's uh, all, all the marijuana in Norway is homemade. And it's starting to become a cottage industry. So you see, in 2017, then you have uh, the seizure was uh, uh, like two tons of hash <laughs> was seized and 508 of uh, uh, marijuana, the MH marijuana. Uh, that's two tons of hash. That's quite. That's quite a lot. Because uh, I calculated how much uh, hash that is uh, consumed in Norway, and it's uh, around eight or nine tons a year. So they catch quite a lot of it, actually. Sorry, are you talking about hash as a chocolate or uh, bud or both? Hash is cannabis. No, I'm talking about hashes now. Yeah. yeah. No, not in general. That's cannabis. Yes. No, hashes is the, the plates. Yeah, the hard stuff, you know, the one you get from Morocco usually. <coughs> Cannabis is more the, 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 the leafy substance. <laughs> so that's, uh, uh, yes. In 2016, we even had uh, three tons of hash stuffed at the border. So it's, but, got, but these figures uh, are very reliable. Uh, a few big cases usually makes these high numbers because uh, once in a while you know we stop like 500 kilos here and 500 kilos there. You know, so uh, three or four of those cases and the numbers go totally out. Punishment. Uh, I always ma already mentioned it. It went from six months in '68 to 21 years in 1984. Both possession and use of cannabis has been criminalized in Norway for like 50 years. Uh, from 2006, the general attorney said that the level of cannabis for your own use was raised to 10 to 15 uh, grams to be dealt with by a fine. So. Uh, then you don't have to go to, go to uh, make it a court case, but uh, it's uh, sort of ad administratively taken care of. In 2010, you had 9,000 fines for uh, this is for uh, for cannabis. Uh, 9,000 no, no, this is for drugs uh, use and possession. 9,000 fi fi fines, 800 conditional imprisonment cases, and 750 unconditional. <laughs> for breach of legemiddelloven and the first paragraph of the penal law. So this means that the small cases usually ends with fine. That's the normal procedure. The ones that actually end up in in, um, in prison are the ones that they can't afford to pay the, f uh, the fines, which usually are quite high. Well, two to five thousand of each in kroner. It's like, like in Icelandic standards. And uh, this uh, varies quite a lot from where you are caught in the country. So uh, it says... Uh, I can't say that we have a Norwegian standard. Okay, so then I'll take a few words about what's happening now. And uh, uh, a lot of people say Norway is going to legalize. No, we're not. <laughs> That's, it's very clear on that. We're not going to legalize uh, the use of possession of drugs in Norway. But the decriminalization has now a majority in the, uh, actually, in the in the Norwegian uh, Storting Parliament. So, they've done it the Norwegian way. They put down a committee that will work with this for nearly two years and make a report. And what will come out of this report and this work of the committee, I, it's, it's uh, quite hard to say, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> I think the signals from the beginning was very positive because they said, um, they said, the reaction from society on the use and possession of drugs for own use shall be moved from the justice sector to the health care. That's the basic line. That's what everyone agrees about. It's not longer the police who are going to 
react and, and uh, be the main actors when it comes to use and uh, possession of uh, smaller amounts of drugs. So, uh, well, one or two parties, uh, like in the, the Kristelig Folkeparti and Fremskrittspartiet, Parti, they are not that keen on this, but the most others are actually supporting this. And on the committee that is put down is that the committee will, among other things, determine the size of a user dose, what help sanctions to be given to the person who's caught with drugs, and what should happen if a person does not follow the offer sanctions given. That's quite interesting because, first of all, what's a user dose? That's not easy to answer because uh, that's quite open for uh, for the ones who uh, and it varies quite a lot between uh, different police districts in Norway and so on. So you actually you don't have any number there, but they usually say that if you are caught with one or two user dose, you should only go to legemiddelen, but with more than you and into the penal law system. Well. But what's the use of those? Hash, is that half a gram? Is it less? Is it more? So it's, uh, it's one of the things they have to discuss and uh, try to find out. Uh. Now they say everyone wants a reform, but... Um, and they all agree on the movement from police to health, but what does re what's really in the reform? That's, that's quite unclear. Uh. Because uh, we have diverse political opinions on this. And this also say that we should look to Portugal. Portugal should be uh, discussed in the report, but they say we're not going to copy Portugal. Of course, we're Norwegians, we don't copy Portugal. But what can we learn from Portugal? So it's quite open on that one. Uh, there's decriminalization of use, that's, uh, that's quite up in the open. And it's also a discussion of the role of the police. This is the white paper, and this, are, this is the group that are put down to, to work out the white paper. And I think uh, many of these people are very sensitive, to be quite honest. Even have a criminologist in there. <laughs> and Rune, Rune Torgersen is a first, first starts advocate. He's uh, also known to be a quite reasonable guy. So, so this, is, uh, this will be interesting. There are also users here. Uh, so uh, we look forward. So, with that, we end with the, the question, cannabis, what's happening now, really? <coughs> Much of the problem with discussion in Norway is, of course, that all the discussion is, when it is on drug users, and it's on the sick, visible ones on the street. There's really no discussion about recreational use. There's no discussion about what I call normal drug use, which is quite normal, uh, spread around society. Even the old ones smoke a lot of pot in Norway. And if you look at international statistics, that's the one that's going up. The youngsters go down. So uh, The reform is more pointed towards the drug addicts, the users of heroin, which has been uh, already in Norway redefined uh, to be victims, not offenders. So they're, they're already in the victim system, so to say. But not recreational users are not. And it's not the topic. Cannabis at all is not the topic. Uh, and I would say at best it's treated with ambivalence. Cannabis is mainly seen, and I think this is like all the, the thing in the Nordic countries, as a stepping drug. And so it's very dangerous, would many people say. Actually, there's more fuss about, if you talk about liberalization when it comes to cannabis, that creates much more fuss than talking about heroin in Norway. So that's an interesting thing. It's seen as dangerous. Legalization of cannabis, no chance. I don't, I don't see it coming in Norway, really. And what, uh, what I'm really afraid about, and uh, I think I, I skipped that one, is uh, uh, prevention, crime prevention. Because the police, they are, uh, in Norway, usually use two methods, which I know sort of front as the most central, their central ways of working. One is called Bishimring Samtalen, which I think they try to spread also to other Nordic countries, which I call dialogue of worries, which if you're worried about something, you know, this. This guy is uh, in a very bad environment, so let's have a talk with him and his uh, 
relatives, and uh, so they often make up a contract of what to do and so on, and also what's uh, youth contracts, which is uh, very, very popular in Norway. And in these youth contracts, you usually have uh, uh, to rely on a country on the control of urine, urine control to detect if you stopped using and so on. And this is this is where everyone said this is very good, but actually we have no research that can prove it. That's very typical. Most of what police say this works and it's great. Uh, actually, there's no research as far as I know that can prove that this is working. And many of the youngsters who've been in these programs said these are very very hard programs, and I feel also that they're treated quite bad when they're in them. So that's, uh, I think the police are going to fight as hell to keep punishment there, to have these contracts and these systems going, to be quite honest. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Thank you for this throughout uh, description of uh, what goes on in Norway. Very interesting, and indeed, we might have uh, had a different perception uh, on uh, most legal, uh, most, most recent uh, changes in, in Norway about your committee. Uh, I think if it's okay for everybody, we could start with a panel, so we uh, don't uh, get to lay back, uh, to back uh, later on the program at Paul. Please sit down there right away, because we're part in a panel, and, and uh, post, uh, questions can be posed to Paul also during the panel. And uh, I would like to invite uh, other people in the panel. We have Helgi, please. Uh, Karin, please sit down. And then uh, Per Ola Trestman, who I haven't uh, introduced yet. Per Trestman, he's a genuine Nordic person. He has started his, his uh, life and career here in Helsinki as a professor in criminal law and, uh, and the procedural law, uh, where he moved to work later on to Copenhagen Business School, and also to University of Lund, where he has been a professor of criminal law and professor emeritus later, and also worked as the dean of the faculty year 2000 to 2009. He has been published uh, books in criminal law and criminal procedure and uh, 100 articles at least in this, uh, in this field. Welcome, Peu. We will have a panel discussion with a topic, what's the Nordic way concerning cannabis? So, do we have a Nordic way? First, I would like to and uh, if we do, what is the Nordic way? How, how can we define it? What is uh, its uh, peculiarities con uh, if we compare it uh, to other countries? What can be the future of, uh, of cannabis policies in uh, Nordic countries? Are we taking the same path? Or are countries... and then take the microphone. But several uh, uh, questions that can be answered here, and um, we don't actually we don't have very much time. We, I suppose we can be a little bit late of the program, so we have about forty minutes here. But I would like to first of all, I would like to give all of you possibility to give you like first impressions like a start of the of the discussion what you on on your mind based on this uh, presentations we heard today and uh, using your expertise also in, in more generally uh, I would like to start with uh, and uh, I'd like to give you also a little bit more room because you didn't have a presentation earlier so, please, the floor is yours. Uh, I will actually begin with a short, Keep a private uh, presentation than the official one. Uh, I will say some word about me and cannabis, or me and, 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 uh, and drugs. Can I ask you to speak even closer to the microphone? I'm sorry. 
I have a back background in Finland. And uh, I was actually during the time when you had the total uh, uh, revision of the Finnish penal code. I was the chairman of the working group who had as a task to uh, make the revision of the drug crimes in Finland. And what was interesting, that was in the beginning of 1990s. And actually we proposed a decriminalization of own use of drugs. Uh, it was uh, all, the, all the members of the, the uh, working group uh, were of the same, same opinion. We shall not have a general criminalization of own use, but we have to have a provision where use of uh, drugs uh, is criminalized when it is done in such a place and under such circumstances that they can promote other people to use drugs. Uh, I can say that that proposal that was not popular. Uh, the Minister of Justice at that time, she, she refused it immediately uh, all on, and very publicly. After that, I have been uh, working in Sweden uh, at the University of Lund and uh, during that time I have uh, written two books actually concerning drug crimes and some articles. Um, I will not uh, tell anything about them, uh, but then I can also say that I am uh, since almost uh, or 25 years I am living in Denmark and I have practice from uh, this field because I live very close to Christiania. Uh, but I will begin to say some more general words concerning uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Swedish drug policy. Because if we uh, want to have a picture of the whole Scandinavian countries, we need to know a little bit more of Sweden than we have had heard until today. Um, I can say that, first of all, um, um, I can first of all say that uh, the general opinion in Sweden that is that uh, the drug problem shall first of all be handled through firm criminal control. That is a very firm opinion. Um, we have in Sweden the penal law of narcotics and uh, that law is from 1968. It has been changed uh, during the uh, living time more than 10 times. And there is a very general, uh, a very distinct tendency. The scope of the criminalized acts has been expanded and the penalties have been more severe. That is very clear. Uh, in practice, uh, the crime control hand has been mainly focused on the drug consumers. And it means very much used of blood samples, and specimens of ur urine. Uh, we have a very famous slogan uh, from the police about uh, two decades ago. It was said, it shall be hard to be a junkie. Uh, that is still living, not so strongly as earlier, but it is still living. And what is very much living still, that is zero tolerance and a drug-free society. Here we can make a comparison to Finland because uh, 
in Finland there was a change. Uh, in the beginning it was also, the, the goal was to also a drug-free society. But uh, uh, since about 15 years that was changed and I know that the uh, responsible politicians in Sweden, they were very upset that Finland changed the general goal for the criminal policy. They wanted actually Finland to go back to uh, a zero tolerance. I said that uh, the crime, crime control in practice has been very mainly focused on the drug consumers. And I mentioned also blood samples and specimens of urine. And there, uh, uh, Bro has made a research uh, 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 two years ago. Uh, first of all, I, I can mention that you have uh, a general provision f uh, directed to the police of how and when you shall take these proofs and um, specimens. Uh, you have uh, what, what is called uh, Rix Police Stewards and Forestrifter or Almena Road on Proftagning with Mistanke on Bruka on Narcotica or Drog Ratfilleri. These provisions are from the year 2007 and they are very detailed, actually, very detailed. But Back to uh, this um, uh, research made by Bro. It was made in uh, 2016. And I quote a part of uh, the report. The police has since 1993 have the permission to demand a person suspected for a pity narcotic drugs offense in the form of own use to give a blood sample or a specimen of urine. Uh, Reds Medicines Verket is the authority with responsibility to analyze such samples and specimens. The number of samples and specimens has over time increased very sharply. During the last 20 years, has the number almost quadrupled, and at the time being about 40,000 persons every year. Uh, they are, in a way, maybe suspected for own use. And then the report continues, at the same time the number of positive samples and specimens has decreased from almost 90% to a level between uh, uh, 75 to 80 persons. There are, of course, big uh, re regional differences. Uh, this kind is much more used in uh, bigger cities and so on, and not so much on the country art. This was a little bit about the background. I will come back uh, later, but we can already now very firmly state in Sweden there are very little interest of nothing else than a punitive control. It has a little bit changed, but not so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peo. You are saying that Sweden, Sweden holds uh, kind of a uh, quite different approach than uh, other Nordic uh, countries. and uh, Maybe not that much interested in, in broadening the approach and going into discussion that has happened in the other Nordic countries. Uh, now I would like to ask comments from other panelists. Let's go there in Order, Karin, please. Um, well, I would certainly say that uh, many of the Nordic countries do seem to be moving in a direction of 
of uh, uh, decriminalizing uh, use and uh, possession at some point. I can say about the timeline, though, but Sweden, <laughs> Sweden seems to be the big exception in that. Uh, so maybe there's a, a, a partial Nordic way when it comes to the legal side of things. Of course, it depends on if you're, you're looking at like, the law or preventive work or, or policy. So I do think there's maybe in some areas possibility that, that, that there might be a Nordic way. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. There's some problems with uh, hearing the microphone. Would you like to repeat like the main messages? Um, so, so the main message was that um, there might be a Nordic way, but as far as uh, like the law goes, be decriminalizing cannabis use and possession. I, I think uh, most of the Nordic countries are going in that direction, but <laughs> clearly not Sweden. So. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. It's a Nordic way minus Sweden. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, as Per, per Ole explained, the need, uh, Swedish way of uh, using uh, blood and urine sample as a kind of a control measure, as I say, it is uh, quite exceptional, at least when you compare to uh, other countries. Uh, Paul, what is your approach to this? Okay, uh, I think uh, I think actually we, there are quite a few similarities between the Nordic countries. Maybe Denmark, in many ways, are the odd one out, not Sweden. Uh, uh, because I think Norway and Sweden have very, very much in, uh, in common. And uh, it's, uh, even if uh, it sounds a little bit different right now, I'm, uh, I'm afraid that we are quite uh, much on the same level <laughs> in many ways. But we have three points, I think, that is typically no Nordic. First of all, it's a belief in punishment. And that, that I still think is there. And it's, uh, uh, I can't really see any way... Uh, uh, out of it. We, and all, all presentations so far also have pointed to this. And the second one, and I think we always forget this, it's that in all these Nordic countries we actually have very strong belief in teetotalism. That not drink, also the avholsforeningene. They are extremely powerful in Norway, Sweden, I guess in Finland too, also in, in Iceland. And they actually dominate quite a lot of what's happening. And I would say at least they do it in Norway. The biggest organizations are all the ones that are pulling in that direction. So, so uh, uh, the slogan "No use" and "Say no" and so on is uh, that's that's Nordic. That's really Nordic. <laughs> There's no thing that maybe a little bit uh, joint now and then is good for you. That's, that that's very un-Nordic, definitely. And the third point is that cannabis use, and I think drug use in general, is seen as something un-Nordic. And uh, especially cannabis use, it's... Uh, uh, I always think about Margaret Mead and her book about the, the clean and unclean. And I think the cannabis, cannabis is the unclean. It's the dirty element. And I think that's also common for most of us, especially Sweden and Norway, we're very clean, uh, clean people. That's, uh, even if we're moving towards a health perspective, uh, we, have, we have to do that because the, it costs too much what we're doing now. So, so I think that's more and uh, that's more and uh, really effect of what we've been doing for so long time that has been creating so much suffering that we have to move towards a health perspective. So that's coming. That's coming in Sweden even. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Paul. You know, you are nature lover, uh, nature lovers. The cannabis also is a nature product, so maybe it comes in a, in the future. <laughs> okay, Helge. Yeah. Yes, actually, I, I, I think, you know, what uh, the Nordic nations uh, have in common or, or is sim similar is, uh, is the criminalization of, 
of cannabis, you know, we, we might have some talks about that there is some discussion about moving from the restrictive approach to social and the healthcare services, but in reality, there is this criminalization process dominating the, the, the field. And, and Iceland, for example, in terms of cannabis, looks towards the other Nordic nations, and we have looked to like Sweden a, a lot, you know, so that's kind of our model, and it's, it's, it's abstinence, you know, it's, it's, it's a drug-free society, and we also look to, to, to Norway, we look less to Denmark, but, 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 but I don't think Denmark is not more liberal than the other Nordic nations, even though the consumption, consumption levels are higher. So, uh, so, so there is, might be some uh, d talks or discussion in the, in the grassroots of all of these Nordic nations about some reforms or alternatives, but once it really goes down to it, you know, to, to, to the parliaments or the, or the governments, uh, at least for Iceland, we don't really see any major change there, you know. And, and if there's going to be change in Iceland, you know, that's something that's going to happen first in like Sweden and Norway, and then we're going to start moving toward the, the, the reform taking place there. So Iceland's going to maybe be looking towards the, our neighboring countries, especially the Nordic nations. So if we don't really see any change happening there, Iceland is not going to change. Uh, for example, you know, Iceland just recently legalized beer, you know, in 1989. So, I mean, we're not going to legalize, you know, drugs. No, no way, you know, <laughs> never, you know, but unless it happens in, in, in Scandinavia. And, and just to give you kind of an insight into, you know, the position towards drugs in, in, in Iceland in society, and, and, it, and it's somewhat similar to what Paul is mentioning here, and that is, it is not allowed or permitted in the Icelandic uh, social media or in, or, or in, the, in, the, in, the, in the mass media to talk uh, about drugs in any positive manner. I mean, recreational drug use is it doesn't exist, you know. It, it, it's, it's only drug abuse, you know. It's not drug use, you know. I mean, you, you cannot go on the public media and talk about, oh, it was great going to this jazz concert or, or to this theater play, you know. I had smoked some joints, you know, and it made it so really great, you know. I mean, you're not allowed to do it. It's, 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 it's zero tolerance towards uh, talks like that. The only what's tolerated in the media about drugs is, I was a heavy drug abuser, but I saw the light. I saw the light. Now I'm drug free. Thank God. So, so, but, but of course with alcohol, we know with alcohol, I mean, you can go on the public media and talk about how much fun it is, you know, to drink alcohol, you know, and all the women that, I, that are, and all the men that I, you know, blah, 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 talk about how great it was singing and blah, 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 even though you don't remember anything, you know, but it was so much fun, you know. You, you're allowed to do that, you know. So it tells you about something about that. Uh, levels of tolerance toward, you know, the alcohol and, and drug problem, how really different worlds these two are. And I don't really foresee any major change in, in, in Iceland policy-wise towards cannabis. The only uh, change that I foresee that might happen in the next two or three or four years is that minor possession of, like, cannabis or, or other drugs will not be placed on criminal record of these people. I mean, and then I'm talking about if the fine is, is at the lowest level, it's possible that the police will change their, 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 their way of doing things, not placing it on the criminal record of young people, 18 or 20 or 22 year old caught with uh, one joint or something. But I think this will even be done very quietly. It will not be kind of published in Iceland, you know. This, this will just be a, how the police will change. Because today, if you're caught with one joint, and it's mostly 95% tobacco, but it's 0.1 uh, gram of, 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 of marijuana, you can end up on criminal record for that, you know. And I, and I think that's not the way, way, way to do it. And I think this might change in Iceland, but in terms of, of decriminalizing drug possession or, or even legalization, I think that's far off for Iceland, but we will keep an eye on what's happening in the other Nordic nations. So if anything was going to happen in Nordic nations towards decriminalization, not to mention legalization, Iceland is, will definitely consider it. Okay, thank you very much, panelists. We can take some uh, questions from the audience. There are a few hands up right away. I think I saw Henrik first and then Petri then in the back row there. Hey, Henrik Tam, Stockholm University. I will not defend uh, Sweden, but I will give two signs of a changing situation. And one refers also to all the other Nordic countries. Around 2010, we 
made a large study of the general sense of justice, presenting samples with uh, crimes, including one where someone smuggled one quarter of kilo of heroin. The judges wanted to give in Sweden five years, half of the Swedish sample with enough uh, information said no prison at all. There is a very strong quest also for uh, rehabilitation in Sweden, and I think in all the Nordic countries. And we had that uh, change, uh, that difference in attitudes in all the countries. I think it was largest in Sweden. And second, uh, even though all the major, all the parties in parliament still take officially a zero tolerance stand, nearly all the youth part, the youth organizations of the parties now confront the major parties and demand a more liberal drug policy. Same trend in Finland. Yeah. Petri. Yeah, Petri Viljon, and not because I'm half Italian and half Finnish, but I think that, uh, that Finland uh, for the next 10 years can show to the Nordic country how and what is the, the, the way to follow. Uh, from the 1st of January this year, we opened the alcohol market, for instance, to 5.5. I think it takes a couple of years, and we will have uh, wine in the shops, and then disappear the, the monopoly. I'm quite sure that the decriminalization of cannabis starts from Finland, and then to the other countries. So this is, I think, not the problem, how but when, and this is not the problem. I think the, the real problem, and I discuss during the coffee break, break with Arne, is how we will use the cannabis and the, the drug. Because we have this history with alcohol, and alcohol is a drug. And if you think that, uh, okay, alcohol is free now, but when it happens 60, 70, 80 years ago, we haven't the, the knowledge how dangerous is alcohol. Alcohol is like heroin. So if you think that now is alcohol is free, it can be also heroin. And cannabis is not so dangerous like alcohol. But that's not the question. The question is how we use alcohol in the Nordic country. Everyone knows how we use. So I think that this is the problem for the next year. If when we have this liberalization, what's happened to the use? We will use the cannabis like the alcohol, so in a quantity like that, not just one joint, but maybe 25 joints? Or what do you think we need also a cultural change in our Nordic country? Okay, thank you for that. Uh, sure. Shall we take one uh, question, comment more, and then let panelists all these three uh, questions posed. Please, could Thank you introduce you. yourself? My name is Pierre Andersen. I'm, I'm from Sweden. Um, my question or comment regards... Uh, we, we saw here that the use level, the level of use of cannabis is very low in the Nordic countries, but still uh, you seem to agree that a lot of things have to change. And you haven't really touched upon why you see the need for change. A couple of you have made the comparison with alcohol, uh, implying that regulation like alcohol could be a, a solution. But given that the problems from alcohol are so huge in the Nordic countries, uh, and it is huge because it's a legal, widely used, socially acceptable drug. So why would adding another drug to that list, cannabis, why would that solve any problems? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for these comments. And uh, could we start like in a row, or if it's okay for a bird, parallel, could you? Uh, I will... Uh, begin to say that I don't believe that we have the same opinion in all the Nordic countries to cannabis. There are differences, and some of the differences are quite big. Uh, 
I can mention, uh, first of all, it is a little bit difficult to say uh, how important uh, the use of cannabis is in the criminal justice system because you have, in general, you have just information about own, own use of uh, narcotic drugs and a very little information about uh, how many of these cases are connected to cannabis and how many of them are connected, for instance, to all the modern uh, uh, substances, drugs, uh, party use, drugs, and so on. Uh, but there are differences. Uh, one special feature in Sweden is that there you have also a provision which allows the police to take, as it said in, in the law, uh, body, uh, make body search and uh, through a specimen from the body and uh, uh, examination of such specimens, uh, when you have a young persons under the age of 15 years, and it is actually the public prosecutor who decides that such examinations shall be made. And that is quite exceptional because that's a body search which in general is restricted to persons who have committed crimes and a child under 15 years cannot commit a crime. And that's Again, one example for, uh, on, on the uh, punitive attitude in, in, in Sweden. Uh, you could also ask, uh, has the, the very restrictive drug policy in Sweden, has it been successful? Uh, a very short answer is no, it hasn't. Because the number of drugs has increased very much uh, uh, also in Sweden, not only in Norway, but it has always it has increased not so much during the last three, four years as earlier. And still the, the, the general policy in Sweden, that is, we shall have, have zero tolerance. And that means also zero tolerance concerning cannabis. Uh, in that respect, the situation in Denmark is, is quite different. Because uh, two years ago, uh, the municipality in Copenhagen, uh, the responsible uh, polit uh, politicians, they had a votation and a great majority of the politicians took the decision that they will go to the government and ask for a law which decriminalize, uh, uh, which uh, make cannabis legal. Uh, not a decriminalization of own use because it is not criminalized, but a complete legalization of, of cannabis. Uh, they had also a plan of how you can buy this cannabis. And actually the, 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 the first pro uh, proposal was, was that you can go to a pharmacy and ask. But the pharmacies were not interested. Then they asked uh, different uh, other possibilities. And what was the result? The result was that 7-Eleven said, we are willing to do it. <laughs> Thank you, Peo. Karin. There's only one microphone there. I'm going to answer your question um, because it's an interesting one for the, from the perspective of, of um, like preventive work, which is <laughs> my area of expertise. Um, I agree that uh, 
it's a big challenge. Um, if if cannabis were to be legalized, we know it would most likely increase use, which would uh, also increase like harm related to cannabis use, uh, which is of course something we don't want or I don't want as, a, as someone who works in the field of of prevention. But again, I I really don't see like that, <laughs> that happening in any of the Nordic countries any anytime soon. And as far as um, the effects that uh, decriminalization would have on, on cannabis use, I don't know. I mean, is there really any research that would tell us, you know, will cannabis use increase automatically if it's decriminalized? How much? Um, is it a big, big problem if you compare it to like the marginalization, marginalizing effect that uh, punishment drug-related crimes has? I don't know. Maybe someone who's a, has a background in research can maybe answer that question. But uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't want, <laughs> I don't want cannabis to be <laughs> legalized, but Thank you, Karin. Great questions, very good questions you posed there, perhaps Paula. Okay. okay. Answering us. Yes. And other other uh, questions. Very, very, very nice to have a Swede uh, who says the same things as Norwegian narcotic police usually says. And uh, so I'm well prepared <laughs> because we hear this all the time. And, uh, and the, 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 the idea is that uh, the low numbers in Norway and Sweden is the result of a great policy that actually punishment works. Um, and um, to, to answer that, I would say no. Uh, actually, these uh, SPAD figures uh, cannot be explained by uh, the police action or that it's prohibited. Uh, this, uh, all the research that uh, I know that has been uh, looking at differences between countries that have uh, different regulation regimes points out that punishment actually does very little. So, uh, and it has nearly, uh, the effect of it is, is marginal, it's nearly nothing. So, so, it's, uh, so most research can uh, point, uh, point that this, uh, it's not punishment, but there's a lot of other factors that keeps uh, the level of drug use uh, uh, varying in different uh, countries. And then, yeah, w what's out of those? Well, it's the general level of use of alcohol and barbit rates and other stuff, you know. If, if you look at England, Spain, countries with sky high use of drugs, they also drink a hell of a lot. They also use a lot of uh, different uh, prescriptive medicines. And we, we always forget that because most dope use is legal. We always forget that when we discuss this. People, uh, you know, also in Norway and everywhere around the world, they, they use uh, barbiturates uh, at a very, very high level, which we never problematize. And, uh, and uh, so, so this, this has to be seen on the one. And it's, it's of course, uh, something that has to do with the regulation, but it also has to do with uh, uh, history of use and culture in the society for, for using uh, different sorts of... Uh, of substances, so so it's it's much much wider, and punishment actually is just a small part of it. And then, of course, it's the uh, good old argument: Do we want one more? Well, actually, it's here, and it's been here for quite a while. No, uh, no, yeah, yeah. Oh uh, yeah, uh, but, but for big parts of the the the, the so, so, uh, people in society, they actually don't care if it's uh, legal or illegal. That's uh, uh, at least the world I come from. This uh, they don't even they don't care that much about it. So I don't, don't think really. Uh, of course, I think it should be accepted. I even go as far as say that it should be legalized, but regulated, and that's the thing we should discuss: how to regulate it. Be yes. And I think that's that's the great thing about the Nordic way. Actually, I do like Systembolaget. Uh, maybe a little bit better than the Norske Vinmonopolet because they have uh, lower prices and better service. 
And they have these nice plastic bags that say that they save 17,000 lives a year, which is maybe, uh, every time I see it, I laugh a hell of a lot. I, I live just by the border, so I can uh, really uh, use or uh, go to the Swedish uh, and buy all my beer all the time. <laughs> Problem, of course, that we always forget when we, of course, there is also positive effects about with punishment. It has, of course, a certain effect on... Uh, on, uh, uh, on um, how much uh, drugs that's available in society, and it's, it's a sort it has that, but it's quite limited. And then, of course, you have to put, take up the, up the costs of your regulation, which no one has talked about, which are documented. They are immense the way of working now. So, so if you start to, to do a balanced scorecard sort of thing on these things. Uh, uh, which I have done. I always I used to dream like this. Uh, oh, I really would love that the police work would solve all my problems. I really would love that the, that the penal system would fix all the social problems. Then I woke up and said, no, it's not like that. They actually contribute with a lot of extra problems, and that's the problem. So that we actually have to solve. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And then Helgi, please. Yes, uh I'd like to participate in this very lively debate and <laughs> panel, and uh, I think it's a fair question there from the from the suite about you know the restrictive approach. Is it the restrictive approach that has kind of contained use of drugs in society? And I, I think there is something to it. The restrictive approach has helped kind of limiting drug use in the general population, especially among people older than 30 or 40. I mean, people grow out of this. Perhaps because that there's a large opposition put in, in the restrictive uh, model, in, in in the sense. But there is also a lot of kind of cultural and social opposition as well. So in the culture itself, there is not much tolerance for drug use. It's not only the kind of the restrictive approach, but it's also in society in general. But but it is fair to say that it's possible that if we well perhaps decriminalize, not to mention legalize it, then maybe this opposition will will diminish. Not to mention, like the, the half Finn and half uh, Italian said, if this would be marketed, if, if we are going to market drugs, we're going to market cannabis, you know, with all these slogans about how great it is to get high, you know, before you see a football game, or well, you slow you down too, too much, you know. But if you go to a movie or something, it'll be, I mean, probably we're going to see more, more use, you know. But maybe it will be regulated use in the sense of, you know, it's on the surface instead of in the, in, the, in the black market. I mean, we don't have any protection of users today. I mean, you have to go to the black market and you don't know what you're right. doing. But you see, there, there are factors fighting each other there, you know. There are issues, you know, that need to be solved and there are problems related with the legalization and probably more use. We see it with alcohol, for example, you know, the legalization of alcohol, legalization of beer in Iceland, we saw more use, you know. It, 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 that's for, for sure it's going to happen, you know, especially if there will be marketing. But in society which, which have decriminalized possession of drugs, you know, without marketing, we haven't actually seen so many differences in use levels, you know. But of course, everybody now is looking to the U.S., you know, with the legalization of marijuana, and we will probably see that in the months and years to come, you know, how much effect this has on, on, on use and problematic use. My guess is that we're probably going to see more use of marijuana in these states that are legalized it, especially like Colorado, which is marketing it intensively. We're probably going to see more use of, of but, but you see, it's, it's very recent. We're talking about the last two or three or four years. We've seen the legalization of marijuana in the U.S., but we'll see it down the line. After five or ten years, you know, if you're going to see higher use levels and prob problematic levels, you know. So, so, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting debate, you know, with no easy answers, you know, because it's even kind of contradictory, you know. So we see how people are very careful about, you know, that we don't want to really do a major shift or a major uh, change in, in our drug policies because, you know, People are concerned about this higher user levels of problematic levels, you know. But the, the current situation with criminalization has also a lot of problems, you know. And I would like to mention just finally with like tobacco in Iceland. I mean, tobacco use was very frequent in Iceland in the, and probably the same in Nordic countries like 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. It's almost out now. We don't really have much smoking among the general population in Iceland. We did that without criminalizing tobacco. We did something else. Thank you. 
Yes, thank you. And uh, I, th I think, uh, sorry, Paul, but we have to <coughs> go to the end of uh, this discussion. But um, I would like us to kind of summarize this, that this, this discussion. I see that uh, what is like common to Nordic countries is that uh, we have a common, <coughs> common approach to criminal policy, meaning that we take uh, criminal law into use only as a last resort. We try to use other methods. We try to use social policy, etc. We try to use uh, use uh, social welfare ideas to, to get not to get people marginalized. And, and and if we don't work with that, we take criminal policy. And we try to be rational with that, and try to use research when we criminalize uh, different deeds. And uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, literature on this that uh, the drug issue has been uh, different. Because there comes to morality, drug has been drugs has been taken kind of a fear and a moral perspectives, and the drug laws have been quite hard compared to to other crimes, and uh, and uh, <clears throat> many Nordic countries have taken kind of a dip, different ap approach than when we discuss drugs and use crimi uh, criminal policy measures, because as a, as a first measure, as we as we heard today, uh, for example, from Norway and. Uh, and uh, and Sweden, but now I see what has happened. At least is that uh, discussion has opened. Now we can we can weigh different uh, different uh, issues like what would happen if we decriminalize cannabis, for example. We can uh, talk about like uh, control expenses. What does criminal what what, are, what what harms does criminalization cause to the users and the society as a whole? What kind of expenses? There will be, and also as was a common comment there, if we legalize, what kind of harms will be caused uh, because of that? So at least uh, talking from the Finland's point of view, we are like, like one step ahead in that sense that we can more openly evaluate the situation without that much like moral uh, panic, uh, uh, fear in, in, in the discussion. But uh, anyway, we could see here that the, that the discussion is quite different still in in a Nordic uh, uh, country, Sweden, taking a uh, really, uh, restrictive approach, well described by Parole. Denmark, on the other hand, having having uh, we didn't talk much about Denmark, but I still have an impression that uh, it's more liberal than uh, the Nordic countries, and then uh, Norway, Iceland, Finland, somewhere in the middle. Thank you very much for coming here, and thank you for everybody who followed the followed this uh, session from the internet. And, uh, I hope we can, and I'm sure we can continue the discussion in, uh, also in the future. I would like to give the floor to Nina for concluding remarks. Thank you very much, Arne. Um, just four very very brief points. One is uh, feedback. Um, you will have on the chairs uh, three questions and you will also receive it on your email. So it takes less than 60 seconds to tick three boxes. That will make us very happy. So please try to do that. Second one, uh, there is a little bit of materials on the table that we hope you take a look at and maybe take with you as you leave. Um, then the discussion is, doesn't end here. Uh, we have a project going on regarding cannabis and in the, before the, um, the end of this year we have a report um, on our web page um, that will look at the um, cannabis control policies in all the, the Nordic countries, what, what is the current situation and also on the treatment of cannabis. So we will be having some more materials there. And also our website, Nordic Welfare Center, um, and especially our Popnad uh, webpage um, has a lot of news, um, reports, uh, popular science, um, information, research, new research about all the different uh, substances, alcohol, drugs, tobacco, uh, gambling and doping that, from all the different Nordic countries. So go there and, and take a look. What is happening? Um, I think that's it. Thank you for coming.
And I will ask also um, you if you can come up here. We'll just take a, a photo together. You can give your uh, uh, feedback papers to Tina here, if you have them. 